Hey there, Internet. Welcome to part two of my haptic adventure. So I wanted to give a little background, clue you into how I got here. I've been messing with CNC machines for a few years. And while I'm very pleased with what I've been able to learn with CNC, there's a bridge missing between manually controlling a machine and having the computer do some of the work for you. And I've, it's something I've wanted to explore in more depth, and I've kept it in the back of my head over the past few years. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem accessible for the hobby machinist. Back in March of 2020, I was browsing Hackaday, and I found a very interesting project called Turn by Wire. They published a very interesting paper on a set of ideas to bridge this gap to give the operator a much closer connection to the machine. It had my attention. I read through the paper, which was very detailed and had a lot of good ideas, but there wasn't any source code that I could use. And so I parked it in the back of my mind. Fast forward quite a few months uh, in the interim, I'd also been very interested in spindle synchronization implementations for gerbil. Unfortunately, my C++ skills are abysmal and I have no background in control systems engineering. To wet my teeth and to try to get some more experience, I dusted off a two-year-old project that I had started for implementing an electronic lead screw for an ESP32 and my manual lathe. I wanted to refactor it and gain some additional experience. While I was researching how to implement the algorithms, I found a project called Dig along the way. And while it's a bit beyond my ability to understand the code, it really helped me confirm my approach. The project incorporated a very detailed explanation of the algorithms implementation and discussed in detail the differences between some of the common approaches that have been taken in different open source projects. One of the nice things about an electronic lead screw is it is kind of the bridge between a manual machine and a CNC machine. These things are fairly closely connected. Also in the intervening months, I had done a prototype of a closed loop brushless motor using a library called Simple FOC. It was a great learning experience. And I also discovered that the community around Simple FOC was very collaborative there was a forum where you could uh, interact with the community and post questions and read other people's experiences with using the code base. Since I had joined the community, I regularly get updates on what people are posting. And earlier this week, I saw a post about how you could use a very inexpensive L298 motor driver to drive a brushless motor with the simple FOC code. I asked for some sample code and the wiring and got a very prompt and detailed reply. Within a matter of minutes, I actually had a working example up and running, and I didn't really have anything in mind to use it for. I just wanted to see if it would work. It was seemed like a nice option to have in the in my back pocket. So I left the test setup on my bench and moved on to other things. The next day, I guess Google's algorithm was at work in the background and presented me with a very interesting video from a YouTube channel called random access projects, which maybe isn't the best name ever, but the content's really fantastic. The presentation was on haptic user interfaces. The idea was, could you have a single user input via a control knob that was powered by a motor that could give haptic feedback, as well as adapt itself to the mode that the user was working in. Haptics are pretty interesting. There's something that you use every day when you use your phone and you feel the phone make a slight vibration. It's something I've been interested in a long time. I think ever since I saw the Novant Falcon probably 15 years ago, which was a 3D haptic interface for interacting with virtual worlds. The video included a link to some source code, which I didn't really understand. My first thought was to try to do some implementation with the simple FOC code base that I was already somewhat familiar with. Since I already had the test set up on my bench ready to go, all I had to do was reprogram the controller. I made an attempt, it really wasn't very good, but it was a good first step. I went back on the forums and explained what I was trying to do. Uh, I got a very quick and detailed response from the 
maintainer of the source code, the author of the simple FOC project. The solution was very elegant and beautiful, just a few lines of code. And that's what I'd like to try to explain to you today is how that code works and how you can implement that code to create haptic textures and dynamic user interfaces that can change how they interact with the user based on what the user's task at hand happens to be. Here's a visual example of how the algorithm works. The red line here is the gain of your proportional controller. The blue line is halfway between your detent and that's uh, the detent here is set to 10 degrees. The purple line is the max voltage and in this case it's set to 12 volts and the green line would would show you the next detent and you can just this would just go on forever i'm only showing the first two detents so the way that the controller works is as you increase the gain you increase the slope and the speed at which the voltage increases so if we set our gain super super high will have a very rapid increase in torque as you turn the knob. So this would be zero degrees from where you currently are. And as you get to one degree, two degree, three degrees, you're already at the max torque. And if you reduce the gain, you'll get to some point at which you, you, know, you don't even start to approach the maximum torque that the motor can apply. So this would be a very soft detent and a soft click This would be the maximum detent click. And going beyond that would have a period at which the motor is exerting the maximum torque before you get to, you know, you're gonna increase the time before you actually get to the detent point at which the motor torque is gonna to go to zero. And the detent point will actually shift to the next point, in this case, 10 degrees. If you change whoops don't change that if you change the detent angle you can see the effect that it has on the overall system so here very early on because we have a much larger detent very early on you're going to hit your max torque so uh, you may need to make some adjustments to try to find where these lines intersect so that you can have a nice clicky feel if that's what you're looking for or again you can you can you can only use a portion of the maximum torque that the motor can apply. So this is really how the code works visually. Hopefully this helps folks that think visually to understand how the code works. Uh, other people will just be able to look at the code and, and intuit how it works. This, this is helpful for me since I tend to think visually. It's also a huge struggle because I think I fell asleep in most of my math classes and trying to remember how to use functions on a graphing calculator <laughs> has been quite a struggle. So I'm sure there's a much more elegant way to uh, do what I did here. Um, for folks who are adventurous, maybe they can post a, a Desmos example in the comments below. I'll walk you through it real quick. These, uh, these are just the motor inputs and there's some in, uh, initialization of the uh, motor driver. Uh, I'm using a library called NeoTimer, which is a non-blocking timer library just to, to make the setting timers a bit easier. Uh, this uh, sets up the encoder. So there's a rotary encoder, an optical rotary encoder with 600 pulses per revolution that's attached to the gimbal motor. Um, here, I'm just setting up some pins. These pins are mapped to the enable pins on the L298. Uh, here, this is important if you don't have external interrupts, you have to, you have to configure it for an internal interrupt. This initializes uh, the encoder. This uh, uses hardware interrupts. This line links the encoder back to the motor. 
here we set the power supply voltage for the motor. This is used to calculate the amount of torque and the amount of voltage that's going to be applied. And then this links that driver configuration back into the main motor object. Uh, the simple FOC requires a initialization sequence so the motor will actually move around and look at the input from the encoder to figure out if everything's working correctly and uh, it'll do some calculations to get everything initially set up so that it can control the motor. There are several control types. This voltage control type is is what simple FOC is using right now for torque control. So they're mapping or, or they're, they're using voltage uh, as a stand-in for torque because uh, right now the, well, with the controller that I'm using, it doesn't have any, uh, it doesn't have any current sensing and there's no, there's no feedback loop for the current. So it has to use the encoder and the voltage that's being applied to derive uh, an approximation of the torque. This is just normal setup of the serial. Uh, you can link the serial to the motor's monitoring functions. And then these are the two initialization routines that gets, the, gets everything set up and ready to work. Uh, you can ignore this. This is just uh, some auto PID tuning stuff. So this is this is the real magic. This is this is a instance of the PID controller class called PID haptic, and uh, we're creating this PID controller class with one term, the the proportional term, and we're leaving the integral and the derivative terms off. So when you set those to zero, those those are not used. There's an output ramp that is the how quickly the voltage will increase given a time period. And then there's a limit, which is the limit in voltage. This uh, attract angle, this will change as the system changes. You initially set it to zero. And when the, when the motor gets initialized, the angle will be set to zero. Uh, the attractor distance, this is really just taking the 10 degrees for each D10 point that we want to use and uh, translating this into radians. Uh, then we define a function called find attractor, and this, this is what, this essentially will uh, take the attractor distance, which is again in radians, and uh, calculate based on the current angle, the, uh, the attractor. So uh, based on where the current angle is, let's say you, we're, we're doing this uh, 10 degree detent, uh, when you get to five degrees, it'll shift the attractor to the next detent point. Then in the loop, we run this loop FOC command. This is what will, um, this loop FOC command needs to be run as quickly as possible. Uh, the motor move command is fed with the output of the PID controller and the input to the PID controller is the attractor angle, which is calculated every loop, uh, minus the current motor shaft position, which is this motor.shaft angle. And then the attractor angle gets recalculated. The serial event allows me to configure uh, different things. So in the demo, you'll see me go ahead and change the, the degrees per detent. And that's through the, uh, the serial input. And then there's a uh, a motor monitor, which will just spit out a bunch of data. You can graph the data or do whatever you want with it. You, this is not necessary for, uh, for, to, for anything other than tuning the PIDs and uh, looking at how the system's reacting. One hundred detents per revolution. Thirty six detents per revolution. Eight detents per revolution. Softer detents.
two detents. One detent. Dangerous detent. Oof. Well, if you've made it to the end, thanks for watching. If you skipped ahead, no problem. This has been a really long video. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below. And hopefully this helps somebody better understand some of the capabilities of simple FOC and haptics.